I was a very young lawyer when I first heard the term gobsat, good old boys sitting at the table. Uh, and of course, things have changed a little bit now. It's good old girls sitting at the table, and, and we even have systematic reviews, so it's not just personal opinion. But it introduced me to the whole world of the sociology of science and the fact that scientists are human beings and they have all the strengths and weaknesses and act like human beings in other respects. And of course, uh, that sociology has been informed by the work of people like Tversky and Kahneman, uh, who help emphasize that the cognitive biases are in full display in the sciences. To help us think about those issues, and in particular, uh, how groupthink uh, affects reproducibility in science, we have three really capable and distinguished speakers this afternoon. Um, our, our first speaker is Lee Jassim, uh, who was uh, not born but grew up in Brooklyn, the brain basket of America, um, <laughs> and uh, where, where I grew up too. Uh, <laughs> and, um, who uh, runs the uh, Social Perception Lab at Rutgers University, where he is a distinguished professor uh, at Rutgers, uh, my alma mater. And uh, he's also the founder, interestingly, of Heterodox Academy. And in addition to his, um, uh, uh, his professional publications, he's written in Quillette and some very engaging uh, popular pieces. <laughs> I, I don't mean to embarrass you. Um, our second speaker will be Mark Regneris, uh, who studied philosophy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Sociology. Sociology, okay. Um, and then went on to become a full professor at the University of Texas, Austin. He has by far the sexiest CV, because um, he <laughs> studies sexual relationships. And um, he's the author of the uh, bestseller, Sex is Cheap. Uh, although some elected officials may disagree. And then our last, <laughs> our last sp speaker, but not, not by no means the least, is a very popular uh, writer, uh, Michael Sherman, uh, whose columns in the Scientific American I awaited uh, eagerly for many years growing up, and uh, who is the founder of the Ste Skeptic Society and uh, founder of the Skeptic Magazine. In fact, he was so accomplished, I was really skeptical he existed. <laughs> but he, uh, now I have true justified belief that he's, <laughs> he exists. No. So uh, I'll turn it over to them, and uh, I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Get like this. Will this work? Because I do not know. I can s stand still. <laughs> there we go, right? Now I can do this, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I really thank the NAS for putting this on. Um, and uh, yeah, I am going to be talking about my understanding. I'm a social psychologist, so I will be drawing heavily on events in uh, social psychology and a little bit beyond to communicate my understanding of the nature of groupthink in the academy <clears throat> and some ideas on how to fight it. Okay, so uh, the, the left domination of the academy, if you only looked at the, if you knew of the data but didn't report the data and simply described it, you, people would think you were a Fox News nutcase. <laughs> I mean, the data are just that extreme. So this is in my field, social psychology. This is from the 2012 election. Um, uh, survey of social psychologists. Voted for uh, Obama uh, 301 to 4 for Romney. Now, I am not here to argue that either one was right or wrong. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. What this shows, though, is an immense, immense political skew in my field, which routinely deals with politicized topics. That's what this shows. Um, that's not restricted to my field. This is actually fairly old data. These are about 15 years old. Um, and across the social sciences and humanities, about 40 to 50 percent of the faculty self-identify as radicals, activists, or Marxists. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, and, and about three or four or five percent uh, self would self-identify as, as conservatives. So you have te literally 10 times as many self-described radicals, activists, and Marxists as you do conservatives. And there's activists. So this is not just like this is what they're social sciences, this is part of who they are. 
Um, I originally had four or five more slides like this because you know every time you do it, it depends on how it measures. But these all show essentially the same thing. Actually, the NAS has a series of reports by uh, researcher Mitchell uh, uh, Langbert shows gigantic skews across almost all the disciplines. So I'm not going to go into that. So why is this a problem? Well, one reason it's a problem is because academia, social sciences especially, are not really a validity-seeking system. The, the entire system is built on social reputation. So getting ahead is entirely a function of how other people view what you do. So how do you get into grad school? Well, I mean, you have to do well in school and all that kind of stuff. But among the things you need are letters of recommendation, preferably from famous, influential people. And that holds through through the entire process. How, how do you get tenure? How, you know, how do you get your first job? How do you get tenure? How do you get promotions? It's all hinges, at least to a substantial extent, on what other people think of you. And even publications and grants. Well, how, how do things get published? Well, other people say it's good. That's how things are. So the entire system is built on social evaluations. And so, I, I mean, presumably, and you know, <laughs> indirectly to some extent, there is some validity issue, you know, and there are people will hold you accountable to some degree. But the direct, the direct incentives in the system are all entirely social, which means the way you get ahead in academia is by getting other people to like and respect you. That's the d directly important thing, not producing something that's actually true. Now, that's not mutually exclusive with producing something that's actually true. But the immediate incentive is to get other people to like you. OK. And so this has, in my opinion, um, has over the last several years, it's probably always been a problem. But, but the problem has gotten worse <laughs> in my opinion, over the last several years, where you know, threats to academic freedom, free inquiry can come from anywhere. They can come from the government. They can come from uh, uh, mass media and political activist organizations. But one of the largest threats, in my opinion now, is actually coming from other academics. So, so far, and this is maybe an incomplete uh, list, but since this is a, a, a link to an essay I have up, uh, posted on the Medium not long ago, about three or four months ago, um, so since 2017, uh, so far I've identified 17 cases of academics who've been denounced or ostracized. They've had their papers retracted. They've either been fired or called to resign. And not, you know, there are times when that's appropriate, like for when somebody fabricates data. That's like completely reasonable. But none of these are data fraud or fabrication cases, which might lead you to wonder why all this pressure to denounce and fraud. Well, usually what you have are ups, uh, you know, these unsubstantiated allegations of s some violation of some leftist taboo. You have allegations of racism, of, sex, of sexism, transphobia. And they're almost never really documented. They're just simply thrown. Um, it happened in a, a sort of a variant on this with this conference, right? So this conference, we, I was one of the many people contacted that we shouldn't come to this conference. Yeah. Uh, there was this a very sort of influential blog by Dorothy Bishop, who's been a science reformer for a very long time. I think she's done a lot of very, very good work, but she came out <coughs> calling on people, you know, to not come to this conference. And the, the core, without, you know, you should read her blog to find out what, what she said, but my understanding of the key argument is this, that the conference is, is essentially a, a conspiracy between the National um, Association of Scholars and these sort of corrupt climate denialist corporate interests. And, you know, and who wants to collaborate with such a corrupt set of interests? And then the third uh, th uh, sort of uh, cause suppose, or allegation for uh, all these denunciations and ostracism are what I've come to think of as unidentified flying errors, right? Because that's how the scientific game is played, right? You don't get, you, you can't sort of ostracize or, or retract a paper on the, you know, on the grounds of, well, I don't like it, it's politically offensive. You have to claim something was wrong. There was an error, right, of some, um, of some sort. And so what an unidentified flying error is, is an allegation of error without a demonstration that anything's actually wrong. So, so you get, well, the theory was bad, or it's illogical, or what, with, without, <laughs> it's just, it's, if you look at the allegations, they are hot air. So I've taken to calling them unidentified flying errors. OK. Now, Irving Janus, the guy who coined the term groupthink 50 years ago, 
uh, practically had, uh, you know, if you include the, the, the political skew of academia, this is practically a pre-registered prediction for what academia would be like in 2020, right? So the more amiability and esprit de corps there is, the more sort of political homogeneity there is, the greater the danger that independent critical thinking will be replaced by groupthink, which is likely to result in irrational and dehumanizing actions directed against outgroups. I suspect that's painfully familiar to more than a few people here. Okay. So how does this screw with the science? I am going to start with a completely non-political example. This is an example of just how normal academic processes produce mythological claims. Okay, so this paper is fairly recent, came out sometime in the last six months or so. Um, I hope you can mostly see it. Um, the re this research team identified about 100, a little over 100 um, uh, randomized clinical trials for the effectiveness of um, antidepressants. And what they found, what you see there, the red dots are negative trials, trials that showed no effectiveness or counterproductive effects. And the green dots are the trial was effective, it improves things in some way or other. And you see it's about 50-50. It's about, about half it works, about half it doesn't work. Okay, so then they tracked what happened next. The next column, this column here, is publication bias. So of course, the positive trials just about all got published. Only about half of the negative trials got published. So now, the literature is about two-thirds effectiveness. Okay, uh, but then the next column is what they called reporting bias, outcome reporting bias. So if there were, I'm making this up, but in principle, this is what they mean by outcome reporting bias. If there were three outcomes, one showed it was effective, one had no effect whatsoever, and one showed it was counterproductive, what gets reported is the one result showing that it was effective. So when you, then, so, so you have an, you know, w w when you include uh, um, outcome reporting bias, the literature now looks like it's about 80, 85% effective. Then you have spin. So even among the papers with this, with my hypothetical example of three, of three outcomes that reported all three of the outcomes, they highlighted the importance and priority of the positive outcome. Even if in the pre-registration, one of the others was the identified as the main outcome. So by the time you get to spin, that now the literature is almost completely purged of negative results. And the final thing they have is citation biases. So th th what the citation biases show are the studies that are getting cited, which is overwhelmingly the studies showing positive effects. So by the time you get to the full scope of the literature, uh, that, you know, making claims about the effectiveness of antidepressants, about 90% or so of it are, are, are described as, as effective, even though the underlying literature is half effective and half ineffective. And there's no politics here. This is antidepressants. I mean, to me, the thought experiment is now add political agendas on top of this. Okay, I hope to fill some of that out. When uh, people, in my experience, when people think about political bias in academia, they tend to think of like one thing, like discrimination against Republicans or conservatives, or they think, <coughs> or they think of sort of confirmation bias, holding studies that sort of adv adv or contest a leftist narrative, advance a right-wing narrative, uh, holding it to a higher standard than other, right? But it's not, it's like all of these things. And actually, this is from a paper that we recently got accepted. The wheel should have several more spokes, and I'm only gonna actually talk about two or three of them, but I'm just trying to give you a flavor that the manifestations, or the potential manifestations for, of political biases on the scientific literature are really kind of uh, extensive. Okay, so I'm just going to walk through a couple of examples. So we're going to start with suppression. So do, uh, do ideological biases, do groupthink lead, leads to suppression of research, research? So this is another amazing paper. It came out a couple of years ago. What Ziggurel did was he identified 17 test studies. Tess is the um, uh, time-sharing experiments in the social sciences. Uh, these are large-scale, nationally representative samples um, uh, in which, which have experiments embedded in them. And these were all or almost all unpublished studies finding two things. One, no evidence of anti-black bias among whites. And now you might say, well, 
okay, prejudice against the null hypothesis, maybe it just didn't get published because there was no statistical evidence there, except the other main thing they found was prev uh, prevalence of anti-white bias among black respondents. So that really kind of undercuts the, well, it's just prejudice against the null hypothesis finding. So, you know, he, now he published the stuff, but he had to, this was essentially a forensic study identifying all this data that had been previously unpublished and would have gone unpublished had Ziggurat not published it. Okay, so that's suppression. Then we have, uh, you have you have, you've actually seen at least a couple of examples already at the conference of how <coughs> um, citation biases can lead to a distorted literature, at least distorted conclusions. So I'm going to walk, I have a million examples, I'm going to walk through a single example here. Okay, so in this table, I'm comparing two, two papers, both uh, published in PNAS. Nice inherent control for quality of outlet. Uh, the one on the top, Williams and Cece, uh, included five experiments with really a variety of methodologies. Among the variety was within and between subject designs, but it was more extensive than that. Um, the context in which they were examining, gen they were all the, both of these papers were examining gender bias in STEM. Um, the context in Williams and Cece was faculty hiring. The total sample size across the five studies was 873. So right there. The moss Rakusin paper published a few years earlier was a single study, so mono method, on hiring a lab manager total sample size of 127. So, uh, you know, simply by every aspect here, you, what you would think that is the, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you reach any conclusion other than the first paper is a higher quality paper. Uh, but now well, let's look at the finding. The Williams and Cece found actually in hi uh, faculty hiring the biases favored women, it was about, about two to one tendency to favor women over men. Uh, but in the lab manager study, uh, Moss Rakusin et al, uh, found bias favoring men in the hiring and evaluation of male or female applicant for a lab manager position. And then what you have are the citations. And what you can see is that Moss Rakusin has been cited basically in order of magnitude more frequently than has the Williams and Cece paper. Um, even the final, I think the final column is actually the most important because it's after the, the Williams and Cece paper came out. And among the many things that this shows is there's about 1,200 papers that cite the Moss Rakusin paper after Williams and Cece came out without even mentioning the Williams and Cece paper. Now, you know, scientists, completely reasonable, you could make a judgment, no, you know, Justin doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. This is the much better paper, and here are all the reasons Williams and Cece suck. Okay, that's kind of how the scientific game is played. You could do that. But no, 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 1,200 don't even mention it, as if it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, I'm continuing. Okay, so the final part of the wheel that I'm going to talk about is what gets canonized. And by, ca uh, to me, canonization is in some ways more important than almost everything else we've been talking about so far. Because the end result of the scientific process is the establish of establishment of some new idea, some new thing that we're, we widely take to be true. Um, and so it's the bottom line production, of, uh, 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 the bottom line product of, of science. And everything else feeds into that and it should be built on strong methods and strong statistics and strong logic and all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of the bottom line. Okay, so I'm just going to walk through one example of canonization. So this is, I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of fuzzy. It's the, from the Annual Review of Psychology, um, uh, which is one of the main outlets of record in psychology. It has a, a huge impact factor. This is where the truths get revealed. Um, this is a, a general review of gender stereotypes. And uh, Elmer's reaches this conclusion. If there is a kernel of truth underlying gender stereotypes, it's a tiny kernel. So you need to know a little bit about the sociology and social psychology here. The kernel of truth idea is the idea that even if stereotypes aren't completely wrong, there might be a teeny, teeny, little, little, itsy, bitsy element of truth in them, right? And I mean, the way I think about that, it's like basically stereotypes are this big, gigantic, rotten cob, and in there is the kernel of truth somewhere, right? So that's kind of the idea, you know, colloquially, what this conclusion is saying is that gender stereotypes are mostly inaccurate. 
Okay, well, that's possible, except she reaches that conclusion without citing a single one of the 11 papers reporting 16 studies, all in conventional, high-quality social psychology journals. These are not published in, like, baby fringe, non-peer-reviewed journals. These are the, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, P Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. These are the main journals in my field, none of which got cited in this paper. Okay, so that's... Groupthink, that's how you do it. Um, I, I'm just going to leave this up here for a second and take a drink. In my opinion, there were a slew of canonized errors in social psychology. Every one of the things here range somewhere between completely wrong and at best heavily, over, uh, heavily exaggerated in the literature. Um, so even if they occur, they occur much less frequently, low, much smaller effect sizes. <laughs> Microaggressions, trigger warnings, I and mean, there's a whole bunch of things. The, uh, the list could really have gone on and on. Okay. So what to do about it? Um, I'm, I'm not claiming I have the answer. In, I don't even know that this really is an answer, but this is the best I can do. So my, my answer is intellectual diversity. And um, well, coming near the end, so... Uh, I view intellectual diversity as having these four components. I'm really going to only talk about the last two, demographic and political diversity, because it just isn't time. And it's now that I tweak the NAS a little bit. So this is the tweet that started the controversy. Um, the, uh, the, the conference was accused of being a manference, right? So, so there's a whole thing in the, you know, in sort of the, the woke academic culture is this uh, people refusing to sit on nan nanos, which is just a panel, and the, and a, let alone a whole conference of men was like a horror. And, and I, I kind of actually mostly agree with that. So I'm going to be tweaking the NAS a little bit here, but tweaking, I hope, constructively. Um, so there are good arguments for why diversity, and this is talking about demographic diversity, makes better science. Um, this is former president of APS. Um, but, uh, th the key arguments, I think, are in the latter two quotes. Validity involves choices about what to study, and people from back different backgrounds make different choices about what to study. And uh, people from different backgrounds come in with, di uh, with uh, different uh, biases, tendency to make different kind of errors, and when those errors clash, you have the greatest opportunity to produce a valid science. So I want to, in, I, you know, the, the whole Manfred's thing was maybe a little bit over the top, but I think there is an underlying truth to that, that the, it behooves any conference, including this one, to get a greater diversity of speakers. Now, I know that the uh, organizers said they certainly invited women and other speakers, and they turned it down. I'm not sympathetic to, like, we tried but we failed arguments. Try harder would be my, my response to that. And so this is just, this is just from on my, my computer. Any one of these women would have been tremendous speakers. That's Pam, uh, Pamela Presky from FIRE. She's tremendous. It's Christine Huff Sommer, Deborah So, and this is Claire Lehman from uh, the Queen of the IDW. They are all tremendous speakers. I've seen them all in action, so they all would have been great. This is actually from the business meeting of the Heterodox Psychology Conference. Um, I'm not going to go into everybody. The two guys in the middle, both African Americans, that's George Yancey and Musa Al-Garbi, I've seen them in action. You would be delighted to hear them speak, trust me. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, um, so, so, but, so why should you really care? I, I, so I think there are a number of reasons you should care. Um, one is, you know, to the, whether it's intentional or not, systematically excluding people who really have something to say is really kind of a problem. Like, they should have a seat at the table. So that's number one. So yes, actually, uh, I'm making absolutely a blunt social justice argument. Number two, I've already made the argument about higher quality so science. And then you, let's say you don't buy any of that. There's optics. Right? It's just, how does this look to the rest of the world? You want to fix science, right? If you want to fix science, you have to get buy-in from other academics, especially other younger academics. And when a conference like this can be so easily dismissed as sort of this old white guy's network, then uh, you, you are shooting yourself in the foot. So even if you don't buy the first two arguments, that's completely fine. The optics alone should constitute a sufficient reason for you to be seeking diversity. Okay, now the thing is, so now I'm going to buy back the heat. 
If you buy that argument, the, so this is my, 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 here I'm targeting the rest of academia because it's the symmetrical problem except it's politics rather than uh, demography, right? The, the academy is so far left that this is kind of how it looks like to half the country at this point. And, and as long as academia continues to look like that to half the country, its, it, it's uh, support among the population is going to continue to erode and for the exact same reasons that conservatives deserve a place in academia, it produces is higher quality science, and even if you don't care about that, it actually would look better to the rest of the world. So it's the, you know, and the thing is, I, I mean, I suspect this argument is probably more receptive to many of the people here than this argument, but they are the same, they are the same argument. It's the exact same argument. So, that's a, okay, all right. So, so what do we do about all this? So, okay, I, kind of my talk was what you do about it, and now what I want to do is have a little fun with it. Okay, so this is one of this piece I just posted. It's the or, what, what I call an Orwell lexicon. So what's an Orwell lexicon? Well, it's Orwell. You invent new words and terms, it, or twist the meaning of old ones in order to advance a political agenda, right? And so you, you have a bunch of these at the bottom, right? Manference, mansplaining, Becky and Karen. If, if you don't know about Becky and Karen, talk to me afterwards. White fragility. You have all these terms emerging from the, the sort of the woke academic left. And so what we need is an, al a, 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 an alternative rhetoric. A rhetoric to push back on this stuff. So here are just a couple from the Orwell, Orwell lexicon. So the, the whole right, whole litany of den denialists. Well, what about Marxism denialism, right? <laughs> Somebody who completely forgets about all the horrors of Marxism. I, I'm sure most of you know about Occam's razor, but I suspect you, most of you probably have never heard of Occam's shoehorn, and that's what you use when the data don't fit the da data to fit it in no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 